Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. First question comes from Bruno. Hey Roma, my name is Bruno. You may know me from the comment section. Yes, I do actually. I have a pretty general question, but a very interesting one. My question is, what do you think the next big thing in terms of distribution model in the watch industry will be? As every major player is doing, or at least thinks about doing certified pre-owned, used or vintage now, what do you think will be the future model of distributing watches? What is the future of selling new pre-owned, pre-loved or vintage watches? Of course, it is both online and analog, but which business has the brightest future? Will the manufacturers get rid of most of their concessionaries and do distribution themselves in the future? Will they work together with major online players such as your company or companies such as WatchFinder, Corona24, Booker, WMP, etc.? I hope you can get what my point is. Basically, which business model has the brightest future in selling watches? When your company and Corona24 want to work more closely together, just let me know. I can build a close connection. Well, thank you, Bruno. We do sell on Corona24, and uh, I'd be curious to see how much closer you can get in terms of relationship with them. We've been selling on Corona24 for quite a while now. <clears throat> but back to your questions. Let's first talk about manufacturers getting into pre-owned. Here's the biggest issue is if I am an AP boutique or a Rolex boutique or a paddock boutique or whatever else, uh, what happens on a day-to-day? -day? Somebody calls my office, for example, says, hey, Roman, I want to buy this IWC you have online, and I want to trade in a Panerai. Sure, no problem. I'll sell you the IWC for five bucks, take your Panerai and trade for four bucks, you owe me a dollar, blah, 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 deal is done. But you can't do that at IWC. If you're somebody that owns a Panerai and all of a sudden wants to go to IWC, IWC is not going to take your Panerai in trade. IWC may take your IWC in trade, recertify it, then what are they going to do? They're going to service it, put it on your strap, have it all redone and put it in their showcase as a certified pre-owned. I, I can see that happen, but not very likely. And the reason behind it is the following. Think about it this way. If I am an IWC boutique customer and I just went in and I paid you $10,000 for a watch at retail. Two years later, I come back with that $10,000 watch and I go buy another $10,000 watch. As IWC, how do I now devalue my watch and by how much do I devalue it? Right? I can't sit there and tell you, well, now you're getting five grand in trade, right? Because now I'm devaluing my own brand. You're gonna be like, well, wait a minute, I just bought this watch from you guys two years ago. I paid you 10, you're telling me it's worth five. I don't know if I wanna get the next IWC. That's number one. Let's say if you don't devalue it, let's say if you say, you know what, I'm gonna give you 75% back of the value <clears throat> of the watch, right? So now I'm giving you $7,500. I now have to invest money into that watch. I have to put it on a brand new strap. I have to send it in to have it fully serviced because I'm the IWC. I'm not gonna give it to Joe down the block to fix it. I'm gonna do it in house, most likely send it to Switzerland or to a service center within, let's say, whatever region you are. Uh, what is my cost on that? I probably tacked on at least another $500 to the cost of that watch. Now that watch is $8,000. What do I put it in the shop for? Well, at least $9,000. So what's the difference between the used and the new watch now? A thousand bucks? doesn't make sense either. So those are some of the things that a manufacturer would be dealing with. The biggest issue is the fact that people don't often want to trade your brand watch. And two, how do you take in trades without devaluing your brand? And at the same token, putting it back out there after service for it to make financial sense to the consumer as well as the company. That's a big deal. And I think, and I think that's the biggest stopper at the moment. Of course, when you're talking about authorized dealers that carry multiple brands, it's a different story. They're just like me. They take in any trades. It doesn't really matter to them. Uh, as far as the distribution, I've talked about this numerous times, major manufacturers right now are cutting out the middleman, the authorized dealer, as well as distributors, right? Because some brands go factory, distributor for the Americas, distributor for Asia, uh, distributors for Europe, right? Sometimes there's multiple distributors in the same regions. Or they go straight to the AD and then AD to the customer, right? Well, the brands that are doing well, the brands that are hot, the brands that are able to sell their stuff in the boutiques at retail, such as Audemars Piguet, for example, or Richard Mills, they've been cutting out dealers left and right over the last few years. What are they cutting out? 40 to 50%, depending on what the dealer cost is on a particular brand, right? Some brands are Keystone, 50 off, some are 45 off, some are 37 off. It's irrelevant, that's extra margin that they're now taking back, putting it back into their own boutiques, into manufacturers, newer, exciting, limited editions, blah, 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 stuff, innovation, among other things. Are they taking additional profits and put in their pockets? Absolutely, but at the same token, out of that additional profit, they're managed to build bigger, more beautiful boutiques, spend more money on marketing, et cetera, et cetera. The future of pre-owned watches is going to stay the same. 
And that is going to be guys like us. There's going, there's going to be brick and mortar stores and the likes of Wempy or Turnell that are going to continue selling certified pre-owned. But for the most part, it's going to be done online. The business model with the brightest futures, I hate to say it, is guys like us because we are in complete control of what we do. We control what we buy. We can control pricing every which way we see fit without concern about hurting a brand, per se. If I bought a particular brand super cheap, a close out of 20 cents on a dollar, and I put it online at 70 off, I'm not concerned with hurting the brand, right? The brands already know that that's going to happen when they do that to begin with, right? Where when you're the brand itself, it's very hard to consciously shoot yourself in the foot, as, as I see it. Uh, will the major brands work together with major online players, such as your company, uh, WatchFinder, Corona24, et cetera? Yes. They already do. So without mentioning many names, I do work with quite a few companies already directly, and that's me buying out their older stock. Closeouts from them, right? Things that they have way too many of and it's not selling, and I just swoop in and buy the stuff pennies on a dollar. It's me buying their take backs. If a particular authorized dealer has a lot of stores throughout the world, and they do take backs where they take all the inventory in that hasn't been selling, that's sitting on dealer shelves, rather than they take some of the stuff back, even newer inventory, I'll buy those take backs, and they're considered to be used watches, right? There's lots of things out there that have been done directly from the manufacturers to guys like me. And that has happened since before the internet, believe it or not. That business model has always been there on the hush-hush, nobody talks about it, and everybody closes their eyes, so to speak. So I hope this sheds a little bit of light into your question. But great question on the pre-owned stuff. Love that question. I'm gonna quickly answer a question from Francis G. Uh, it's something I discussed on the last Q&A video when I did the general uh, market update, but I wanted to reiterate this one more time. Hey Roman, I started following your channel recently. I found it randomly and have to say, it's giving me so much insight on the watch to watch trading industry. I've binged countless videos and I've tried to soak in as much as possible. I like your ability to say truth and how things are. Being a former wealth management guy, I find bluntness refreshing. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, with that said, my questions are, with economic downturn in recent weeks, do we just put things on hold when it comes to trading, selling, and buying? I feel might be a must if you can. I watched a video of you talking about the recession of eight and how watch values drop 20, 30, up to 50%. Uh, to me, it sounds like it's a great time to buy and hold. What should we look for in watches and future outcome? What's your opinion? Thanks, Roma, for any insight. I'm just going to quickly reiterate what I said in the last Q&A video. If you guys didn't see, check it out. Right now is a good time to buy. Not invest, Ian crossed that out, but to buy. Because I always say watches are not an investment, they're an expensive toy. But it's like anything else out there, right? There's plenty of deals to be had in a down market, whether it's in the stock market, real estate market, what, antiques, art, it, wine. The, when the economy goes down, due to whatever reasons, a lot of things go down. So again, don't look at it as an investment, don't look at it as a buy and hold, right? If you're looking to buy and hold, then go out to vintage, right? Go out to stuff that is already 50, 60, 70 years old. Find deals on that that are gonna be maybe 20, 30, 40% cheaper. But believe me when I tell you the really, really good vintage stuff, it's not gonna go down value because those that have it, they're gonna put it in the back of the safe and they're going to wait, you know? But you can get out there and get stuff that's pretty choice. If you wanna buy and hold, get out there, buy some vintage with the hopes, and I say hopes that this market will pick back up. There's no guarantees out there. I told you guys numerous times. Just because you go out there and buy a prime example, let's say, of a vintage Daytona or a vintage GMT or a vintage sub, doesn't mean that that's going to be popular and in demand five to ten years from now or three years from now or, or let's say three to six months from now when all this is over, hopefully, right? Look at it from a perspective of, hey, I've been wanting to buy this particular watch. The market has been super high. This watch has been trading $30,000 and I felt that it was too much to pay for that particular watch even though I could afford that thirty grand. but right now that watch is trading, let's say, at twenty four. $22,000 so now I'm finally going to get out to get the watch I want enjoy it and pay 20 to 30 percent cheaper that's how you treat what's going on in the market today hope that answers your question Frank more corona questions from Switzerland question from Daniel uh, big fan of the channel can easily say you're the most knowledgeable guy on YouTube when it comes to watches thank you very much I was wondering what you take when it comes to Switzerland's situation with the coronavirus how it will affect the watch market they have the second most cases per capita and it seems like they're pretty much shut down operations there you think this will have any effect when it comes to prices for any new models or hard to get prices in present time and or the future easy but tough question and I'll tell you why uh, it's sort of like a two steps forward one step back type of deal because right now with all the panic that that's going on in the world, 
I shouldn't say panic, let's call it uncertainty of the great unknown. That's the biggest scare for everybody in any business, whether it's the watch business or the shoe business. It doesn't really matter, right? It's the great uncertainty. What's going to be? We don't know when this thing ends or how it will end, et cetera, right? That's the two steps forward towards a fallen market. The one step back is the fact that Switzerland is shutting down. What does that mean? They're not producing watches. Depending on how long this epidemic lasts, and you know, the longer it lasts, the bigger the effect they obviously have, right? It's gonna be directly correlated to the fact that they're not manufacturing and putting out goods. Obviously, as you can imagine, there's a lot less buying. So with them not manufacturing, let's say over the next two, three months, yes, it's going to decrease merchandise, but I don't know if it's gonna decrease it enough to sort of offset the effects of the panic or, or the fear of the great unknown with the coronavirus. Plus, if I am in a, a Swiss manufacturer and I've been closed down for six months, that's six months worth of business that I have not done, right? And don't get me wrong, it's not like they're gonna stop today and that's it, they're not, they have plenty of back stock that's ready to ship, right? It's not like they make something and ship it, make something and ship it, right? They make the stuff in batches, they produce ahead of time to meet demand, to meet certain orders that were, let's say, were placed in Basel, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we don't really know what that mathematical coefficient will be, which is market demand slowing down, them stopping production, and then at the same token, once production opens back up, how much stuff are they gonna make or get out there, or are they still getting stuff out that they already have? You know what I mean? So either way, you know they're gonna try to make up for that lost revenue somehow, or those that are smart won't. Like Rolex, for example, or AP, or Richard Mille, if they stop production for the next nine months, I would pick up where I left off and not try to make up for that nine months, therefore creating a real shortage in the market and having those prices come back up quickly. I'm an engineer by trade, you know. I took statics and dynamics, right? And this is where you have to solve, th you know, seven equations with seven unknowns simultaneously, right? This is kind of like that same thing. So I hope it sheds a little bit of light on that question. Next question comes from Steven, and I love this question. It gives me a chance to show something off. Uh, which I normally don't do on what's on my desk. Roman, I want to start off by saying I love your channel. I admire your knowledge and honesty about the industry. I think people like yourself have given the average person more knowledge about pricing in the market, which can only benefit us as purchasers. Thank you for that. And honestly, transparency has been my thing from the very, very beginning. I, you don't know how many customers I've spoken to and flat out told them, look, my cost is $7. I'm going to sell it to you for eight because I would like to make a dollar. Hope you feel it's fair. I don't care. I'm not the guy that tries to hide anything. At the end of the day, those that understand that this is a business, as I sell something, I make money. Uh, there's no secret in that in any business for that matter. But, uh, and I never weaved around that stuff. I just kind of told people how it is always. But in, in, but in any case, my question is regarding the Rolex Skydweller. I've never seen one on your channel, nor have I seen you ever comment about it, which considering is the most complicated watch in the Rolex lineup surprises me. Also, I think I have noticed this, as I own a 326935, the 2018 release with the rhodium dial, and I'm just wondering on your opinion of this watch and why you think Rolex doesn't seem to produce very complicated watches in comparison to AP and Paddock. Thanks for reading and look forward to hearing your opinion. So you have the rose gold sky dwell. It's, that's actually a beautiful watch. I love the chocolate dial when I first came out with it, uh, but the rhodium dial, that dark gray rhodium dial, I think it's beautiful, just the same. I couldn't really pick between the two. So why no love for the Rolex sky dwell? There's much love for the Rolex sky dwell. Let me show you something. I was in Oman a few weeks back, right? And I was on a buying trap. Let me show you what I bought myself. Look familiar? Let me give you a closer look. I bought myself the most desirable Sky Dweller, which is the stainless steel with the blue dial. Now, you guys are thinking to yourself, oh, Roman, that's so cliche. You went after one of the hype pieces. I didn't just go after one of the hype pieces. At the end of the day, I absolutely love this watch. I love the fact that it is the most complicated Rolex, but most of all, I like the way it looks, which is I always preach to you guys, buy what you like. So why did I all of a sudden get out and buy this particular watch? Because it's not just any Sky Dweller. This one I bought from a friend of mine in Oman, and this has the Kanjar logo in the back. What is a Kanjar? It's actually the traditional sword that you see in the middle, sort of that crooked sword that's in the middle, right? And the fact that you have the crown on top of the logo shows that this watch was made for the Sultan. Rolex uh, sells those watches directly to the Sultanate of Amman, which he then in turn keeps a lot of them and gives a lot of them away as gifts. That's how you find them in the market. People resell them out at a ridiculous market because they're super rare. And I paid double retail for this thing, just so you understand. And that was a hookup. 
a guy I know in the business I consider a friend, uh, Eric Ku, who is the biggest vintage watch expert out there in my book. He actually wrote uh, an article, I'll link it below, where he explains how this entire thing works and how to find correct provenance for these watches, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, if you saw the logo in the back of the watch, it's engraved something that a jeweler with a laser machine could probably do. The only way to ensure that you're buying a proper watch is to know the provenance of it. And when it comes to Rolex, there were other brands made, obviously, but when it comes to Rolex, the only way you know this is a legit watch, and I'll show you this, is who the watch was sold to. And in the back of the card, you'll notice it says Sultanate of Amman because it goes directly to them. Otherwise, if somebody's trying to sell you one of these and you don't feel the logo is correct and so on and so forth, unless you check the provenance of the particular watch, you will never know. It may indeed be a copy because, again, today's technology, you can certainly engrave a lot of things in the back of the watch. Those were many other watches with the things on the dial. We have a Lecoultre in stock that has the Oman logo on it. And, the, and I don't have boxing papers for it, but I do know it's legit because of where it came from, where I bought it from. I bought it from Oman, from a guy that specializes in these type of things. A previous version, Daytona, the 116520, faced like 117,000 in auction because again, Daytona is a number one selling watch. So I figured I couldn't go wrong uh, by paying 30 grand for this particular timepiece. This is gonna sit in the back of my safe for a while. I will wear it. Right now it's brand new, but I will wear this particular watch. I also picked up a couple of ladies pieces with the same logo, same type of paperwork. Uh, if you guys are out there looking for collectibles, even though all these things are expensive toys, there are certain things out there that would make others more collectible. And that is, uh, you know, how many are made. There weren't many blue sky dwellers made for the Sultanate of Oman, so therefore, you know, this would be a collectible. But again, you never know. Uh, I don't know if anybody will pay me 30 grand for this watch today. Well, they will for this one, but let's hypothetically, you know, with everything that's going on in the world today, I don't know, you know, what is this worth today versus tomorrow? So, I love the Sky Dweller. I have a Sky Dweller, a special Sky Dweller, that is. Sorry, I haven't shown it much love, but honestly, the only reason probably I haven't is because whatever Sky Dwellers come into our office, they go in and out, and I don't really, I don't really get a chance to, uh, put them on what's on my desk to talk about them. I think the only Sky Dweller we have in stock now is probably a two-tone, which is not the most popular, although I love the two-tone look on it. But yes, love the Sky Dweller. I'm gonna put this back. And by the way, uh, the Armani Rolexes, they also come with boxes that have a logo on them, just the same. So it's good to have the matching box. Here's a good one from T-Bone. Uh, hi, Roman, thank you for excellent content. I really enjoy your vids. I was wondering how your company compares in size and reputation to Watchbox and Crown and Caliber. I've known about them for years. I've seen plenty of articles recommending them here, talk about them, and they have even mentioned each other. But I have only heard about your company from your YouTube channel. Are you mostly B2B, super high-end? Do you just not advertise a lot? Or am I just not in the known? You seem like you would be a go-to dealer. What am I missing? Thanks, T-Bone. I appreciate this question. It gives me a chance to talk about my company, obviously, which I don't do a lot. Again, the purpose of this YouTube channel is not to advertise luxurybazaar.com. Uh, here's what I'm going to tell you about, and I've seen plenty of articles recommending them here, talk about them, and they even mention each other. This is all marketing. There are so many different ways to market an online company, and one of them is articles, 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 articles. The more you mention, the more Google juice you get, et cetera, et cetera. And these are blog posts that you pay people for, and they write articles about you. When it comes to online presence, right, somebody like Watchbox, and I know them personally just the same, and Karana Caliber, they spend a lot of money of online marketing. Go to their website, look at some of the prices and some of the pieces they have and compare them to prices on other websites. Not necessarily mine, whichever other website. You'll notice prices might be slightly higher. There are two approaches you can take to online sales. You can spend a shit ton of money on marketing, which is your Google pay-per-click, which is your blogging articles, et cetera, et cetera, among many other things like retarget marketing, like uh, social media advertising. I'm not going to get into details of, of uh online marketing, right? That comes at a heavy cost. And if you, in lamest terms, we can use Google pay-per-click. You know, you can pay more per particular click. Somebody searches for Rolex, you have the highest bid, you'll show up first, along with all your articles and, and videos and everything else that goes along with it. But that increases the cost of your product tremendously. So you have to find a happy medium. How much do you spend on marketing before you have to have a humongous uh, markup in order to recover those costs as well as make an acceptable margin on that particular watch. Oftentimes, uh, companies such as Watchbox or anybody else for that matter, again, I'm not talking particularly about them, 
uh, that spend a whole lot of money on advertising, they end up making less than me because the marketing budget eats into their profits greatly and they end up having to charge more. And people will pay somebody like Watchbox more money for a watch. Let's say, let's say they'll pay me if I'm less known or anybody else for that matter because they feel warm and fuzzy inside because they're everywhere on the internet. So that formula works. But that formula also exposes you greatly in times like this when the market is down and you're sitting on a humongous marketing nut because it's not just paying the Google or anybody else. It's also paying the staff to manage all that. It costs a lot of money to do so. In my marketing department consists of three people. The other companies Companies out there again I can't speak for anybody in particular the more money they spend on marketing the more staff they need to handle that or an outside company etc etc I were mostly b2b 80% of our business is b2b I guess about eight years ago or nine years ago we got into heavy-duty wholesale and we sort of lost sight of the retail market because we were doing so well and still are doing well uh, doing wholesale but like year, exactly a year ago by hiring a new CMO I'm actually reversing that and uh, we're going to have more concentration on retail than versus wholesale because again my end goal is actually to sell this company to do that I can't sell a wholesale operation you know wholesale business is not something that can, that's tangible that can be sold and what are we doing about it we're doing more of what Watchbox and Crown and Caliber among other guys out there doing in terms of online advertising but we're doing, taking a little bit of a different approach because we've been around for almost 18 years now a lot of our retail business is repeat client as much as I would like to say 100% of the clients come back to us they don't you can't make everyone happy somewhere somehow somebody gets dissatisfied to tell you that we're perfect we're not nobody's perfect but majority of our clients a huge majority of our clients do come back and majority of my sales department they work with their existing clients when certain inventory comes in before it even makes it online it gets offered out privately to clients that we've had throughout the years and a lot of it gets sold that way I like to consider myself to be that go-to dealer especially for those that have bought from us before they again they tend to all come back uh, and I also don't like comparing myself to anybody else listen it's not a secret a company like Watchbox uh, took on an investor to the tune of 150 million dollars if somebody came into the to me with that type of investment today I wouldn't I still wouldn't do what uh, Watchbox or Crown Caliber do uh, because I feel that in today's day and age of online marketing the old ways are dying out and there are different ways to do so and the one thing we're concentrating on right now is brand name recognition which is exactly what you're talking about so I hope I shed a little bit of light into your question T-Bone here's somewhat of a challenge and a question uh, from Marvin uh, Roman love the channel I have a question for Tuesday's q and I have a growing passion of watches and have my own dreams for watch ownership collection for the future however many online pages or youtubers concentrate on male dominated timepieces there's a little content or mention of watches for females trying to push my love of watches onto my wife I would love to get her something that she would like something that would be a good investment for the future and in turn a heirloom piece to pass on to my daughter I've singled watches out for my boys already I feel women's watches offer great value when it compares to men's and I believe there are some great brands where you can pay substantially less than their male equivalent counterparts that said my wife isn't crazy on watches so spending too much would be a waste my challenge to you what would you make for a good future heirloom option for my wife around three thousand dollar mark could be a pre-loved item she says she likes the look of Cartier I feel the tank is a boring option too many of them but fits the price bracket she likes a larger watch but a classic style thanks for the content and look forward to hearing back from you best regards from Africa Marvin okay well I talked about ladies watches and hey I'm not the guy that shies away from ladies watches if you go back in my episodes you'll see quite a few episodes on uh, women's watches as well but if I look at the demographics of my channel 95 percent of my viewers are Indian male I hate to sound this way but this is when it comes to watches it's, it's usually a men's world these are kind of like toys for boys right and it's you like boys with toys and everybody knows that I'm not telling anything that you already don't know something that would be a good investment for the future I told you guys before watches are not an investment they're expensive toys so my suggestion is you get out there and buy her what she likes right you said you mentioned she likes larger watches a heirloom piece to pass on to my daughter well I don't know about you guys but uh, certainly anything that would be passed down to me from my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather would be a heirloom to me regardless of what it is and regardless of what it's worth I have uh, some old Soviet watches that came from uh, my grandfather and a couple that came from my wife's grandfather they're heirloom watches to me and they're not worth anything you know they're, and they're maybe worth a couple hundred dollars to somebody that wants to buy but to me they're priceless therefore they are a heirloom regardless of what they are 
As far as an option for your wife, again, I said, get her what she likes. You know, girls tend to treat watches more like it's a jewelry piece versus anything else. So you can look at a brand like Chopard. They're more of a jewelry piece than they are of a time piece, right? But I don't think you should shy away from the tank. You're saying it's a boring option. There's too many of them. Yes, there's a lot of tanks that were made, but it's also a very iconic time piece from a very iconic brand such as Cartier. And last but not least, you can look at a Rolex. Look at a 36 millimeter day chest out there. You can get some of the older pieces out there in that particular price range. Again, it's the most recognizable brand in the world. You can consider it a heirloom. It's a watch that can take a beating and last forever and certainly something she could potentially pass on to your daughter or daughters. I'm not sure if you have one or two. Uh, if you wanna talk about, again, simple, elegant, classic, the Cartier lineup, has a lot of classic pieces outside of the tank line that you should look at. If Rolex is too sporty, perhaps, as I said, there's plenty of pieces from other brands out there, let's say like Chopard. The price range that you mentioned is a bit tougher because ladies' watches tend to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, they're usually either made out of a precious metal or have some sort of a precious stones on them. That's what they manufacturers tend to do in general to drive the prices up. So, you know, $3,000 budget may be tough, but a brand like Cartier and Rolex are certainly the two where you can find something for her. Hope that helps. I'm gonna take one more. This is more of a question slash request. And this is from a long time viewer. And I don't really mind doing this. People ask me for shout outs. Whenever people ask me for a shout out, if it's somebody that I know and somebody that's just a viewer, and uh, I don't really mind doing it. I, of course, I get a lot of requests from people that are not my viewers. They just want to shout out, but uh, those I don't do. This is from Michael Frillin, whose question I just answered recently. Uh, Roman, thanks for making these videos that I enjoy by many. And in these troublesome time, it is important to have a positive things to talk about. Someone commented that Rolex and Swatch Group are closing. That is just bad. I suppose they must do whatever they can in order to keep their stuff healthy. Thank you also for the gun safe idea. Never thought about that before. They are easy to find here, so I should get a collection worth protecting. Wanted to ask you, since you did a shout out yesterday, if you could do one for me. We offer architectural and design services internationally. Uh, plus I share various properties for sales. My IG account is Michael Freiland Bespoke Services. Ian, if you can throw that up there, because I'm sure I mangled it. Is there a possibility for Russia to develop a strong watch business? There are a few quirky brands would be fun to see them grow plus luxury craftsmanship over there used to be really good uh so there's your shout out as far as russia development strong watch business is very difficult you know we live in the world of swiss made watches and russia has made uh quality timepieces in the past and the movements were superb uh but it's you're just not going to beat the big boys you know Switzerland, number one, and then you have the few German brands. Everybody else is in the shadows of Switzerland, and it's very difficult to get out of those shadows. The, during the hot market, Russia revived the brand name Palot, which means flight, um, and uh, they did make a few high-end watches. There. I think they even displayed a Basel one time, but I don't think that m went much anywhere. Uh, they did get certain nostalgic consumers, nostalgic to the Soviet times, that pick up a few of those watches, probably within Russia itself, but for the most part, I don't think it went very far. I don't see them getting out there and, you know, competing with the big boys. More people start talk about the 36 millimeter day just being ladies' models, but I disagree. Does this mean the day date is considered to be also unisex? I can agree to call, but ladies' model, no. It is not a ladies' model, it is a men's model. But what's happening now is you have a lot of ladies wearing men's watches. I've mentioned to you guys before, my wife owns a bunch of Rolexes that are bigger than 36 millimeters. And they're not even unisex. They're, these watches were made to be men's watches. But right now, there's a very thin line between men's and ladies. And ladies tend to wear a lot of the men's watches, and I see nothing wrong with that. But to be precise, according to Rolex and according to to me and anybody else out there, those are still men's timepieces. And last but not least, you say, I also have a 50 Fathoms question. A guy chatted with mentioned several known problems with bezels, they malfunction. He was very sure about it. First I heard about it, how about you? I've heard of bezels malfunction on multiple watches, but these are case by case basis. So just because you have one gentleman that had a problem with a 50 Fathoms bezel doesn't mean that they all have problems or are problematic. So again, it's all based on experience and again, one out of every so many watches from doesn't matter which brand is going to end up with some issues here and there. But you shouldn't label the entire brand or the entire lineup of watches within the brand to be problematic because one particular gentleman said, oh, I had a problem with it. It's him that had a problem and maybe a few other guys, but the majority did not. So, Michael, I hope that answers all your questions. Again, I don't mind giving you a shout out. You've been a long time viewer of mine and a big contributor to the questions of Q&A. So if you guys are interested in architecture and design services internationally and various 
properties for sale around the world, check Michael out. Give him a call. I'm sure there's some deals out on the market right now. Well, guys, that's it for me for today. Uh, as always, don't forget, email all your questions to Roman Sharf from here to here or here to here. No, Roman Sharf at LuxuryBazaar.com. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try to do my best to get to as many as I possibly can. Other than that, remember, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber to my channel, and most importantly, click the share button. By you guys sharing this video brings in new blood to my channel, and this is what helps it grow organically, and I absolutely love that. Other than that, I'll see you guys next Tuesday.